Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak to Bill C-30 and to share some of my reflections, not only on this government's budget and its implementation, but how this government views its relationship to Canadians. I've been open in my critique of this budget. There was some good, some things to be optimistic about, but ultimately this long anticipated budget lacked the courage required to lead this country into a bold new future. Canadians were not given a clear picture of what concrete steps will be taken to lift us up from our darkest hour. What we all need is leadership. A leader speaks with clarity. Instead, we often spin our wheels with mixed messaging. This government has clearly indicated that we will be net zero by 2050, while missing the point entirely that the decade we are currently in is actually the most important to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. A leader speaks with consistency. On the one hand, this government declared a climate emergency in 2019, and then within the month had purchased the Trans Mountain Pipeline to shepherd it through construction to more than double oil sands production. A leader acts with integrity. This government says that no relationship is more important than the relationship with Indigenous peoples, yet we see court injunctions enforced on unceded lands across this country in the name of law and order. Reconciliation has lost its meaning. This budget is just another example of symbolism over substance, where we maintain the status quo under the guise of transformation. I'm certain I'm not the only one feeling that the last 14 months have both trickled by at a snail's pace and simultaneously disappeared in the blink of an eye. Last March, the world had to stop, to stop traveling, to stop going to the office, to stop Sunday dinners with grandparents. We had to adapt. Week by week, month by month, we were tested. We saw COVID sweep long-term care homes as residents could not access PPE or rapid testing. We closed our borders as a nation and many provinces chose to do the same. And in those early months, there was no certainty about vaccine production timelines. All the while, tremors were shaking the economy, hitting small and medium-sized businesses the hardest. Now we find ourselves 14 months into this pandemic and the Deputy Prime Minister has tabled a budget said to focus on Canadians in the middle class and those seeking to join it. This middle class obsession is yet another way to avoid talking about the widening gap between those experiencing extreme poverty and the wealthy elite. We are in the throes of a housing crisis from coast to coast to coast. Not only is it becoming more and more difficult for young people to purchase their first home, but people cannot afford apartments as rental market prices are skyrocketing. People across the nation still do not have access to a primary care provider, mental health care professionals, or the ability to pay for their medications they require to live. Research published last month exposed that over half of Canadians, 53% of them, are within $200 of not being able to cover their monthly bills. This includes 30% who report they are already insolvent, with no money left at month's end to cover their payments. This is unacceptable. How have we let income inequality reach this point? How is it that we are unwilling to face it down directly? Instead, our government would rather reflect wistfully on the middle class, while banks increase their profits and children go hungry. People are having a hard time. The people we work for, they have done their best to manage so far. But in the last month or two, I have felt the increased weight of it all in their correspondence as it comes to my office. People's financial reserves are exhausted. Their emotional reserves are exhausted. They don't need insincerity from their government. They need to be seen. When over half of your population is living with the anxiety of being able to make ends meet or already being unable to do so, Perhaps this middle class concept is little more than a relic of a bygone era. I think it's important to name things as they are so we can approach them with integrity. I want us to have real conversations about offering stability, health, and well being to Canadians, meeting them where they're at, understanding their urgency, and acting. This budget is a missed opportunity to truly offer Canadians a shift to directly improve their quality of life. I was hoping that one lesson taught by the pandemic was that we were able to act quickly and put in place life-changing programs like the Canadian, Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. It kept people quite literally alive in many cases. Even with the CERB, this government demonstrated indifference to the most vulnerable. We determined an amount that will be livable, knowing full well that we continue to ask persons with disabilities, seniors, and those on social assistance to live on much less. We had a chance to offer Canadians the stability of a ground floor to ensure that basic needs are met. We could have offered a collective sigh of relief with a guaranteed basic income, but instead many Canadians are still holding their breath. And I won't hold mine while I wait for the promises made by this government to come through. Another lesson I was hoping to see reflected in the budget was the need to address racism and systemic inequality. We still wait for action on missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. Words will not protect them. 
Words will not have their cases investigated the way they should be, and words will not root out hate and white supremacy in our society. The anti-racism secretariat should have a robust plan to reach into every corner of our institutions to confront the vectors of power that have been at play since colonization began. Racism kills. We must adopt Joyce's principle that aims to guarantee that Indigenous people have equitable access to all health and social services and to the highest attainable standard without discrimination. We also need concrete, long-lasting actions for change in the criminal code, police enforcement, and the carceral system. We know that our society will not be able to thrive until we break down the barriers that prevent people from living their full lives. Until there are real reparations, real justice, we cannot talk about reconciliation. This budget is supposed to be about building a more resilient Canada, one that is better, fairer, more prosperous, and more innovative. But without implementing a guaranteed livable income, I don't see how it will help Canadians to be more prosperous. And while refusing to hike the capital gains tax and re a reticence to impose a significant wealth tax, this has nothing to do with being better or more fair. Who will bear the brunt of the deficits anticipated for the next decades? It's one thing to announce long overdue investments in healthcare and housing, but these were needed decades ago. Will this government have the courage to implement a tax to target the large corporations that are profiting off this pandemic? As things stand, these corporations are the ones building back better, and they're doing it on the backs of Canadians. The minister also said that this budget is in line with the global shift to a green, clean economy. Everyone here should know without any surprise that I strongly support that vision, but I wish I was able to believe that this statement had value beyond the rhetorical. I see the situation we are facing as a potential opportunity. As the entire world looks to shift away from fossil fuels, we are given an incentive to figure it out now to invest in innovation that will meet the energy demand with renewable energy or that will reduce our total energy demand. The economic opportunity of new industries combined with an effort to redirect workers to these sectors holds immense, immense potential. I know that some Canadians, indeed some members of this house, see me as an idealist or perhaps even naive, but my commitment to the rotational workers in my home province and beyond is real. And I believe with every fiber of my being that their best futures are not traveling to and from Alberta for dwindling work in a dying industry. Their knowledge and skills can be transferred to benefit the economy of the future, one that is sustainable and renewable, one they can proudly leave to their children and grandchildren. But that takes courage. Courage to stand your ground, to do what's right, even when some people don't like it. I know that with all of my colleagues in this house, we share the common objective of improving the lives of Canadians. And I also know we see different ways of getting there. As a woman, a mother, an educator, I want to put the emphasis on the well being of people above all. I know that with a healthy and happy society, we can all thrive. What we need is a government with the courage to lead, a government that will share a vision for Canada that inspires us, and a resolve to charge forward in that direction with confidence. This is how we will transform our society. This is how we will build the Canada of tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? Qu'est-ce uh, commentaire? We'll first go to the Honourable Member for Regina Lubin. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I had the pleasure to listen to the member from Fredericton's speech. And she, always, she ended up with something I think is very interesting, perpetuating the myth that the oil and gas industry is dead. I don't believe that to be true. I think the can Canadian oil and gas is more ethical and environmentally friendly than any other gas and oil sector in the world. So why wouldn't we, as Canadians, do our best to export our oil and gas to countries across the world so that they don't use dirty, environmentally less friendly oil and gas from countries such as Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, or Russia? Why wouldn't we promote our energy sector so that we could lower emissions around the world instead of perpetuating the myth that Canadian oil and gas is dead. Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I thank my honorable colleague and I appreciate his passion and, and, and you know, his support for the oil and gas industry. And, and to be clear, I said the oil and gas industry was dying, not that it was dead. We clearly still have a need for, for Canadian oil and gas. And I absolutely want to, you know, to highlight the, the ethical uh, standards that we have here in this country. Um, but it's about the transition. It's about using that oil to lead us into the future. Um, we know that petroleum products are, are, are still in use um, and are going to be in use for some time to come, but we can make a conscious effort to change some of the ways that we use it um, to lead us into that you know, green economy future. So it's, it's not about it being dead now. Um, it's about preparing for that day to come and acknowledging that we need to shift. We can't wait. 
Um, so thank you very much for that question. Questions and comments, the Honorable Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I really appreciated the uh, answer that the member just gave uh, to that last question. Conservatives c seem to come by this narrative that uh, when it comes to oil, it's all or nothing, and you either support it or you don't support it. But I uh, appreciate the position uh, that this member is taking on it, realizing that, uh, yes, we have to uh, utilize oil in the short term, but ultimately would like to get to something that is less dependent on oil. Can she highlight what she sees as, um, you know, what that means for the future? She has young children, I have young children. We both uh, care about what the future will hold for them. Uh, how does she uh, perceive this transition benefiting uh, future generations? Or for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm certainly appreciative of that question as well, um, especially in light of being a mother. Um, you know, any decision that we make as a government must be made, you know, with the, the foresight of future generations and how they're going to benefit. Um, and certainly oil and gas can contribute to building wind turbines and solar panels. Uh, so the renewable energy that we know is ready and available and affordable for Canadians now. Um, so that's very much how I see this transition and this, you know, happening um, in Canada. And I also, you know, really want to highlight the need to reduce our energy demands there's so many ways that we can retrofit commercial buildings, residential buildings. Um, look at all the, our personal decisions that we make on a daily basis as far as energy consumption goes. And there's ways that we can reduce while meeting the demand that we currently have with renewables. Um, so just a comment as well, I don't believe we need to emphasize um, a broader future of nuclear energy. Um, I really think it's about reducing that demand of energy first um, and then utilizing the amazing renewable technology we have now. Merci, M. le Président. J'ai beaucoup apprécié le discours de ma collègue, là, notamment ses préoccupations envers les plus vulnérables, préoccupations que je partage, évidemment. Il y avait ce matin dans le journal l'histoire très triste d'une mère de famille monoparentale victime de violences conjugales qui a trois enfants qui peinent à se trouver un logement au Québec en ce moment. Avec les revenus qu'elle a, les, les, les loyers pour deux ou trois chambres sont à peu près 15, 16, 1700. Ici à Longueuil, ça n'a absolument aucun bon sens. Pendant des années, il y a eu... Bon, le gouvernement a lancé une, une stratégie sur le logement en 2017, mais pendant des années, il n'y a pas eu de fonds qui ont été versés au Québec parce que les négociations euh, aboutissaient pas. Et on aurait pu, on aurait pu loger cette dame-là si on avait signé il y a quelques années, si le gouvernement du Canada s'était pas obstiné à vouloir mettre ses drapeaux partout, on aurait pu loger ces gens-là. On a vu aussi ici à Montréal des des camps de, de des campings d'itinérants qui ont été démantelés, les gens réclament du logement social. Est-ce que ma collègue pense pas que est-ce qu'elle pense que le gouvernement fait assez pour aider les plus vulnérables notamment en logement La députée de Fredericton. The honorable member for Fredericton. Uh, thank you Mr. Speaker. And I, I thank the honorable uh, member for that question as well. And, and as I mentioned, we're in a housing crisis um, and it's playing out in multiple ways. Um, you speak about the impacts of, of you know, victims of domestic violence, um, not being able to, to turn to a safe place to you know, put a roof over their head with their children. Um, you're talking about some of the, the tent cities that we're seeing in, in our, our big city centers. Um, it's devastating. This is Canada. You know, it's a beautiful, prosperous country where everyone should have the right to, uh, you know, affordable housing, and we're just not there yet. So I would really would have appreciated seeing stronger steps taken to address this. Some more investments have been made in housing, but we know the Rapid Housing Initiative was so oversubscribed. We have to do so much more. Um, so thank you very much for that question. Uh, time for a very short question for the Honourable Member for uh, uh, Couch and Malahat Langford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, as brief as I can make it. I'm just wondering uh, if I could get the members' thoughts. You know, this, this Budget Implementation Act provides for the legislative framework for setting up child care, yet in an earlier attempt by the NDP to set up a legislative framework for pharmacare, the Liberals voted against that. I'm just wondering if the member can uh, comment on sort of the different approaches the Liberals have on child care, which is arguably very good, but on pharmacare, which uh, we certainly need more work on. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the, the member for that question. Um, absolutely, you know, it was nice and encouraging to see the, you know, the plan to implement a, a national child care strategy, but without the groundwork laid, uh, you know, with conversations for provinces and territories to get on board. Um, and that was the large criticism that we saw um, as far as the, the motion uh, it tabled um, by our NDP colleagues for a national pharma care program. So there's a little bit of a cognitive dissonance there. Um, and really, we just need to put our heads together and get the job done and deliver for Canadians and do the groundwork that's, that's required to make sure that that happens and respect provincial jurisdiction. 
addiction. So um, I'm ready to do that work. And I'm, I'm, I know that my colleagues at the NDP are also willing to do that. Let's get the rest of, of this house on board to do it as well. Thank you very much.